when it comes to work ethic, it's something that I've seen change a lot over the years. And in fact, in my lifetime, I remember as I started in the workforce, how work and work ethic meant long hours, lots of sweat, lots of dirt, blisters, and hard, hard, hard physical labor. And as I've aged and as I'm in a different time of life and in a different occupation now, not doing farm and construction and, and so forth, now I have friends that just tease me and say, it'd be nice to only work you know, an hour and a half, basically a week on Sunday morning, three 30-minute sermons. <laughs> if only they had a clue, obviously. It goes much beyond. But, but you know, when it comes to work and work ethic, what does that look like? Yeah, I think sometimes we misunderstand it. We're dealing with the topic of sloth, and if you're not careful... You'll say, well, I work hard. And you don't realize how selective you've been with that. See, how slothfulness sneaks into our life, it, it, well, it's kind of sneaky. Yeah, let me give you an example. I had a guy I was just talking with today that shared, you know, my boss told me years ago that I could have an A at work and an F at home if I wasn't real careful. Oh, do you see how selective we can be? I mean, we can put in really hard work here and be totally lazy here, put in really hard work over here and be totally lazy over here. See, it's, it's not just a blanket thing. Few of us are just blanket lazy. But we all have a little bit of lazy bones in us if we're not careful. And we got to decide, how do I deal with this? You know, I, I was reading some old job evaluations. I, I hate job evaluations. You get to the end of the year when it comes as a supervisor looking at others and talking. I mean, they're helpful, but they're difficult. And, and I was reading some such funny examples it, it just uh, of ones that I'd read on the Internet. It said, works well when under constant supervision and cornered like a rat. Ugh. You know, he should go far, and the sooner he gets started, the better. <laughs> uh, she got into the gene pool when the lifeguard wasn't watching. Ow. Well, we're talking about work ethic or the sin of sloth today. It's part of the seven deadly sins we've been discussing. And the seven deadly sins, several theologians back in the Middle Ages got together and said, here is what we believe are some of the worst sins. Now, we know when we read the Scripture, sin is sin. And one sin separates us from God. It results in death and that it's by grace that we've been saved, all of us. And so there aren't any deadly sins the way they might describe it, but these are ones that we struggle with. So we're taking a look at it. And the title of this series is Where Mercy Meets Us. Now, a sloth. <laughs> you know, the sin of being sloth, uh, a slothfulness this is, it's the only one that actually has an animal named after it. I mean, a sloth is the, the slowest moving mammal on the face of the earth. I and mean, it's a toothless, you know, leaf eating, tree hanging out animal that only comes down once a week to go to the bathroom. I'm like, if you only come down once a week to go to the bathroom, why can't you just do that in the tree as well? I mean, it's funny, this animal is so slow moving that we get this idea of laziness from the animal or the animal got its title from us. Now, when it comes down to it, we're going to look at a scripture today that might make you think a little different about how we look at this sin of slothfulness. You know, it's not just the, when it comes down to the wasting of time, it's also the priority of your time and how you use it. We're going to be primarily in Mark chapter 14. If you'd like to open your Bibles, open your device, or you know, uh, get open on our, our Hub app to follow along in the outline, Mark chapter 14, the setting is this. It's in the final hours of Jesus' life before he goes to the cross the following day. He's had the last supper, it's called, with his disciples. He's, he's hung out. He's had a meal with his disciples. Uh, he's, he's had the very first communion with his guys celebrating his death to come. And the salvation is going to come through that, though they have no idea. They don't get it at the time. And then he grabs three of his buddies and goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, Peter, James, and John, kind of the inner circle. And he says, okay, guys, let's go. And that's the setting as he goes. 
And he tells them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus goes off to pray and his buddies kind of let their claws out as a sloth does and hang on to a branch basically and they fall asleep. You know, Jesus made it extremely clear that he wanted his buddies relationally with him. He, he, he was struggling. He had a difficult time that he was facing. And as he goes around to pray, he, he just kind of wants his brothers there to be praying with him. And yet, instead, they're snoring logs away. He comes back and, and he says, guys, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Hey, man, he's hurt. Hey, and the son of God here is with his buddies. He's hurt. He's like, guys, I, I said, would you watch? And he couldn't even... Stick it out one hour? Hmm. You know, it's interesting. Though he had said that I'm crushed to the point of death, they didn't really get what was going on. They didn't have any idea that he was facing the cross the next day. They didn't realize that he had been pleading with the Father, oh, Lord, would you take this cross from me? If there's any other way, let's do it. And they fall asleep. Now, how does that relate to us Well, not only do we do that with Jesus as well, we do that with the people we love and those around us all the time. We come home from a hard day's work, whatever it is that we do, we're tired, we're worn out, maybe mentally, maybe physically, whatever it be, and we walk in the door, and rather than sharing and having a meaningful conversation with our spouse, rather than getting down and and, and rather than getting down on the, the ground and playing with our kids and spending some time with them and asking about their day. It's just easier to sit down on the couch and ugh, scroll through Google News or, or go through our social media or watch another episode of The Waking Dead and, and just kind of, why would we do that? Because it's easier. It's just plain easier. People will say, you know, I, I, I fell out of love. I just don't have those feelings anymore. And, and they're really lying. It just kind of turns my gut sometimes when I hear people say that because what happened is, is they've just stopped doing what they used to do. Because you do what you used to do and you'd have the same feelings that you used to have because feelings are a byproduct of what we do and, and we just kind of forget that in relationships. You, you, you go down the road and all of a sudden people are gone and people are out of your life because you've stopped investing in them, whether friends, kids, spouse, whatever that may be. See, love is a verb. You know, with God, this is a verb as well. And it is something that we must work at. No relationship stays together decade after decade after decade without work. You know, in fact, I'd like to just take a quick moment and celebrate you know, some of those who've worked and, and st- been together for a long time. If you've been married more than 30 years, would you please stand? I, I just want to say good job. Please stand up 30 years anywhere. Good job. That's awesome. Now, remain standing for a second. If you've been married more than 40 years, remain standing. Wow, we still, good job, that is awesome. You know, I I love to see longevity. Thank you so much for setting an example because we need that today. And so much brokenness, so much hurt, just to know that somebody's made it can encourage the rest of us. So thank you for doing that. Peter, James, and John, if you were to ask them, hey, guys, What would you do different about that last night with Jesus? Their first instinct, I can just imagine, is going, I had no idea what was going to happen the next. If if I had known what Jesus was dealing with, of course I would have stayed awake. I would have pinched myself just a few more times. I would have got up and walked around. I wouldn't have sat down and leaned against that tree. You know, how does that relate? Well, you have no idea what's going on in your neighbor's life. You have no idea what's going on as well in your co-worker's life. You have no idea even what's going to happen in your life or your family tomorrow. That affects today, guys. Men, ladies, kids, that affects today. And it needs to affect how we interact with others. So relationships matter both vertically with God and horizontally with others. 
We cannot get lax in this. See, a temptation is going to happen to just kind of be lazy about it. You know, temptation comes in so many ways because sin is really just a distraction from God's message, from God's mission. I mean, Jesus started his ministry 40 days out in the wilderness, duking it out with Satan, and he had totally understood how important it is to watch and to pray. And so when he goes to his guys here in the garden, he's like, guys, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. Oh man, he knows what he's talking about. He's like, don't be slothful, guys. You know, as, as Peter, one of the guys there that night later writes, and I think he, he might have the words of Jesus in his own head as he, as he wrote, he says, stay alert, watch. Same thing Jesus said, watch out. And he says, here's why. Your great enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We got to keep our guard up. We talked a lot about temptation this last week. If you weren't here, I want to encourage you, please get online and listen to that one. We talked about lust. We talked about temptation and how vital it is to keep our guard up. And I want to challenge you, please understand how important it is to deal with that. Now, also, when it comes down to it, you could summarize a lot of this in just the word commitment. I mean, uh, mentally, I've always been able to push myself further than I physically can go or should go. You know, I, I, you know it's like when I ran marathons for years, I, I would just collapse basically after the finish line because I'd have nothing left. And it, it just, uh, so often I end up being in the medical tent and have oxygen on me. And that, that's not necessarily a good thing. At the time, I was like, oh, that's great. I left it all there. And, but Physically, I just, I'm realizing as I get older that it's kind of important to know your limits. And uh, scripture, so I get what he's saying. He says, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Man, in so many ways, that is so true. Physically, whether it be with temptation, whether it be with just how easily we're swayed to just how this body is not meant to last forever. You got to be so cautious to stay engaged mentally with your king of kings. You know, uh, if not careful, we can just kind of get back into, oh, just having this kind of slothful mindset. And, and we kind of kick back in a, a recliner almost of life. And, and Satan goes, yeah, I got him where I want him. You know, uh, Solomon wrote in Proverbs some awesome stuff about just being lazy He's like, at one point he's challenging, he says, get out of bed, you lazy bones. And he's talking about work ethic. I'm like, that's a pretty blunt statement, and you lazy bones. He says, he, he compares us saying, you guys need to learn something from the ants. The ants work in the summer, and, and so they have food in the winter. They never stop. They're always going. And he gives this great picture. Paul goes on to say in the New Testament, he says, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. And I'm like, oh, that's a pretty harsh statement in today's society. We don't talk that way. He kind of... Paul would have had probably a pretty big problem with that guy a few months ago that, that was sued, suing his mom and dad. He's in his 30s, not wanting to work, living in their house still, and he's suing them because they kicked him out and said, it's time for you to get a job. I'm like, I so hope you've grown up because that, you ought to be the most embarrassed man in the United States. I mean, I to be suing your parents, really? Because you don't want to get a job? I mean... This is serious stuff, but we have that same mindset. It goes kind of deep. It kind of reminds me, by the way, on a side note of Christmas vacation and Cousin Eddie. You know, Cousin Eddie's not had a job in seven years, and he's like, seven years? You couldn't find a job? And then his wife's like, he's been holding out for a management position. <laughs> Too many of us have work beneath us rather than just saying, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Whether that be in the relationship, whether that be at the actual job you go to to make a living, whether that be with God, well, oh, that, I, 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 that's just kind of beneath me. And no, it's not. You know, I know I might sound like a little bit of an old codger up here talking about work ethic, and you know, but we all need this. You know, I, the Animal Plant had a show just not long back about the cycle of life and different animals and, and how just to survive, what they have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, they, they have to go eat, and that means they have to work 
to survive. They have to watch out that someone doesn't take them out, that they don't become someone else's meal for that day. They have to, every day, they cannot, they don't just look for pleasure. What am I going to do for fun today? They're, they're trying to survive. And as, as humans, we miss that sometimes, especially spiritually. See, spiritually, we're a lot like an animal out there who's vulnerable, just trying to survive day to day, and there's a roaring lion, the devil who's looking to devour. We got to watch and we got to pray. So Jesus once more goes away and he prays, and then he's crying out to the Father. One of the most tender scriptures. Read this out loud with me from the screen Abba, Father, he cried out. Everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me, yet I want your will in to be done, not mine. Oh. I love how he just reveals his humanness, first of all. He's just totally vulnerable before us, saying, I don't want this. I don't want to deal with this. Please, God. And yet he also ends with such depth of maturity, but not my will, your will be done. And all the while, as he goes back to his disciples, they have their claws wrapped around the branch, hanging and snoring logs still. And he walks away, comes back, and finally he's just like, okay, guys, it's time. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And they're like, what? They'd become too comfortable. And here's what I need you to hear and what I need to hear. We need to hear is that we've become too comfortable we're just way too comfortable. You know, I, Jesus spoke to a church in Ephesus and kind of quoted similar words to what Paul had said as well in a letter to them already when he says, you've forgotten your first love. You need to do again what you once did or, or you're going to have your position removed from you. See, Paul had already warned him, he says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like the fool's but like those who are wise, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. You know, there are three valuable lessons I want to draw from these texts today. You know, first of all, it is so vital that we think eternally. Say that with me. Think eternally. we got to think eternally, continually. See, it's not just the, the, the amount of, of what I have time to do today. It's prioritizing what I do today. It's remembering my purpose today. What has God called me to do that is beyond? That, that is, it's not just a matter of how do I make a living today. It's also, how do I invite God's presence into my life today? That's thinking eternally. Because if you haven't done that, I so hope that you've gotten right with the Lord and that you've begun to put him first. It's so much more than a decision. Too many people are looking for a savior and not for a Lord, and yet they come together if you're going to follow him. Being Lord is saying you're giving your life to him. So think eternally, because you need to prepare. You don't know when his timing is. When you're going to breathe your last, you have no idea. So we must accept the mission today. Accept the mission. Say that out loud. Accept the mission. You know, I love the old uh, you know, secret agent, Mission Impossible series. You know, the, the, the secret agent would be given this secret message and, and it'd listen to it and then it would explode or burn up or destroy it and somehow they had to get rid of it and it was... It, should you accept this mission? There was never a time where they ever stopped and said, nah, I don't really feel like going on the mission. I think I'm just going to go eat a ham and turkey sandwich and put some cheese on it and some mayonnaise, maybe have an ice cream cone afterwards instead. Nah, I'm just going to sit back and watch another episode of, you know, Survivor reruns. I, I, I'll just, you know, the voice, that sounds good today. I'll just do that. Yeah. You know, that's unfortunately how a lot of times we live with God's mission, which is so much more important than just another mission that goes out to do something for the government 
You know, our mission is to love God, love people, bring the two together. Let's bring that down real quick in a reminder. Love God. It's about, it's about serving him. It's about reading his word. It's about praying. It's about recognizing his presence, acting as if he's real and saying, God, I want you in my relationships today. It's about just loving him with your whole heart. It's about loving people. It's what we do in the church. It's what we do in our life groups. It's what we do throughout the day as we just recognize that people are created in the image of God and, and that we're called to do life together. And then about bringing the two together. It's about sharing our story about what God has done in my life, that God might do that in their life as well. It's so vital that we continue to understand our mission. See, the decision is a daily decision, not a one-time decision. Too many of you think it's a one-time decision. I'm a member of the church. I, I, I was baptized I, I profess Christ. I said the sinner's prayer. I, 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 I did that. Check Jesus box is okay with me. No, that's not how it works. That's not at all how it works. It's a lifestyle that you have to commit to. See, you're to live for God each and every day. Live for God. Say that with me. Live for God. I and mean, that is what we got. This is a life, not just a day. Disciples were thinking short term in this situation. I'm just so tired, and they just didn't quite get it, and they're just kicking back. And you know, the sad thing is, is that describes us a lot of times. You know, they just didn't get it because they didn't know what was happening the next day, and. That's such a picture of you and a picture of me, if I'm not careful. I uh, read a scripture this past week that I, I want to share with you. Psalms 90, verse 12. Such a wise prayer. It says, teach us to realize the brevity of life so we may grow in wisdom. When you understand how fast life is going by, emotionally, physically, spiritually, all that, it just changes how you interact with others. It changes how you interact with God. You know, if I were to say and look honestly at how much time I have left, which none of us do, we all tend to live like, oh, I got tons of time, when you don't know if you have tomorrow. And I heard a tragic accident of a, of a young man in college just this week who passed away here in town. Just, just passed away in his sleep. You have no idea how much time you have left. But if you live to the average age in the U.S., it'd be 78 years old. You know, that would mean at my age of 48, I have 1,560 weeks left. That's how many marbles, basically, I have right here. So when I get to 78... I would be down to the empty if I took out one per week. So how am I going to spend my time? Well, this week I'm going to well, I'm going to go on vacation. Well, next week I'm going to do reruns on Netflix. You know, next week, well, I'm going to That's kind of how we spend our time. And and we forget what really matters. When you get down there's just a few marbles left. Some of you are pretty close to getting to that. And you're hoping there's going to be a few more given to you. You're going to go, oh, then I'm going to get serious. Whoa, 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 whoa. If you wait to then to get serious, it's already too late. It's time to get serious now. See, here's a sobering fact for me, and it is for you as well. You don't realize how much time has already gone by. For me, I've already lived 2,496 marbles. I have... I have fewer marbles left than I've already spent. So what really matters in your life? Does what this says in it, does it matter to you? Does, does your vision, does your purpose line up with God's? If not, what are you going to do to change it? Don't be slothful. Pray with me. God, I ask in the name of Jesus that, that you would teach us to number our days and to 
prioritize our time in a way that you're honored today and tomorrow and the next day and that we wouldn't waste our time. God, I ask in the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, that each person here would would realize the brevity of their life and to begin to invest it rather than just waste it. God, I pray that for myself each and every day. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a song of invitation, and this is an opportunity for you just to do a self-evaluation. How are you doing when it comes to the different areas of your life? Because if not careful, you've been selective about this sin of slothfulness. What is it that you need to work on? If you'd like to pray, we'll be in the back right-hand corner, top and bottom.